again for another episode. And I'm Betty Bima. And I'm Gloria Altania. And we're the Pablum Partners. And you're watching 10 out of 10. That's right. 10 out of 10, where we cover the latest and the greatest with our top 10 list. Mm-hmm. What's, on the, what's on the roster today, Gloria? Oh, well, I was just about to get to that. Today on the roster is places based on true places. <laughs> what? Places based on true places. <laughs> I, was like, I had cut you off. I was like, oh, was it? Okay. <laughs> We're okay. doing films. We're doing films and shows based on true places, right? Yeah, real places. Real places. Yes, but I still like your style because you got that good energy, girl. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get into it. Let's start with number 10. Yeah. We Bought a Zoo is a family movie loosely based off true events. In the film, Benjamin Mee and his family purchased a zoo, Rosemore Wildlife Park, located in Southern California, and took on its challenges such as the upkeep of the property and caring for the animals. In real life, Benjamin Mee is a British man and the zoo that he and his family purchased is actually called Dartmoor Zoological Park and it's located in Devon, England. The zoo remains open today. The Mees donated the zoo in 2014 to the Dartmoor Zoological Society. However, Benjamin is the CEO of the charity and continues to live on site with his two children. That's amazing. Yeah, that's really cool, right? Like, uh, so his mom was actually uh, selling her house and looking for another place bigger for the family so they can all stay. And um, Benjamin's sister found a brochure of um, the home and the zoo. And when he went to visit it, they fell in love with it because, you know, he started, he had love for animals and the family fell in love with it and decided to upkeep the property and help out the animals because you know the the actual uh Dartmoor uh, zoological park was gonna close so they didn't want anything to happen to the um, animals so oh okay it's so crazy because I met an actor that was actually in that movie one of the child actors was in that movie I met them about like a few weeks ago wow really yeah are they like (laughs) are they grown now or what is it you said a child actor yeah child actor he's he's older now but back then yeah he was younger Man, that's that's really cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I can't wait to check out the next one. The next yeah, clip. The next clip. I'm sure you all remembered the movie The Shining. Well, the Stan Lee, located in Colorado, has been known to have paranormal action throughout its establishment, even before Stephen King visited. The Stanley was completed in 1909 and was made for the elite crowd to come get away with its 420 rooms. So, if you're looking for a nice, quaint place to stay and maybe some paranormal action, go visit the Stanley in Colorado. Dude, I've never visited that place ever, ever. (laughs) Really? I think it would be so interesting to spend the night just because you know it's fun it was the movie because okay so there is just a little bit of activity but it's not like you know oh, no, like, no way I'm not mm-mm. anywhere there's activity just like uh those shoes Lil Nas X came out with those shoes that have the blood in it and stuff I don't do that I stay away from stuff like that no oh thank you I'll pass no. not even for Halloween you wouldn't not be even for Halloween no no. Oh man, come on. <laughs> so you're telling me you would stay in that place? I would. I would. Maybe if I had some accompanied someone <laughs> accompany me, you know. But I would definitely be interested, at least drive by, walk in, you know, stay for a party, something. <laughs> oh my gosh. No, I would. Not me. Yeah, so mm. <laughs> let's see what else we got. Okay.
The Cecil Hotel, built in 1924 in Los Angeles, has been the inspiration of many Hollywood projects. In particular, Ryan Murphy's American Horror Story Hotel, starring Lady Gaga. Deemed one of the spookiest hotels in the region, American Horror Story made a nod to the hotel in the fourth episode titled Devil's Night, which is riddled with notorious serial killers that include John Wayne Gacy, the Zodiac Killer, Jeffrey Dahmer, and Richard Ramirez. While most of these serial killers did not stay at the infamous hotel, Richard Ramirez did. Known as the Valley Intruder, the El Paso, Texas native wreaked havoc on Southern California and San Francisco Bay as he would kidnap, assault, and murder more than 15 victims in the span of a year. During his crime spree, he would spend some time living at Cecil Hotel before eventually being caught after a series of carjacking attempts. His reign of terror was also the inspiration for films such as The Night Stalker and Serial Killers. Other weird incidents have occurred at the Cecil Hotel, resulting in a total of 16 deaths. Twelve of those deaths were alleged as suicides, where people would fall off the building or, in the case of the young Canadian student Eliza Lamb, would be found on camera appearing to hide from a stalker before being found dead in a water cistern on the hotel roof. The other deaths were confirmed murders. It earned the hotel the name Hotel Death. The Cecil Hotel has attempted to erase its horrific history by changing its name to Stay on Main and doing a major renovation. But if you know, you know. That's right. If you know, you know. You know, okay? You know not to go to this place. First of all, it's um, a few blocks away from um, Skid Row, right? Oh, now, okay. I haven't been down there in a long time, but I remember like when I first moved to Los Angeles, I saw Skid Row and there's like a lot of, um, there's a lot of activity happening down there. So that hotel would be used for people who were doing all kinds of things, like anything from uh, drugs to like uh, sex workers and things like that. So it has a reputation in Los Angeles, right? But one thing that really freaked me out was the, um, the student from Canada, when she moved to LA, it was her first time in LA and she stayed at the hotel and she had this bizarre behavior and they ended up finding her in the water tank. And ever since then, I'm like, oh my gosh, heck no. I would never like stay at that place. And it's crazy because it's been featured in a lot of Hollywood productions, so. Oh my gosh. Okay, so my first question is, did they find out why she was acting all weird, the Canadian student? Well, the family said that she had um, a bipolar disorder and she was known for not taking her medication. So they do blame it. Maybe it was on that. But my whole thing is, number one, how did she get to the rooftop? Number two, um, they said that she found her with no clothes on. Uh, they found her with no clothes on and she was inside of a tank. So you have to lift up the tank and like get in. And it's just one of those weird hotel stories, just like the other, remember the other girl that uh, she went to a party at a hotel and then ended up in the ice freezer. It's just one of those weird, spooky stories that remain unsolved. I guess we'll never know. Yeah, that's, that's very unfortunate. And it is quite creepy. I know people, especially like, like me, myself, when I search for hotels to stay, like, you know, I try to find things that are affordable and, you know, nice and comfortable, but mm -hmm. mainly affordable. And so if the prices are right, you know, you're like, oh, I'm going to get it. I don't look to see like, oh, did, were there murders here? Let me see. And, you know, oh. like, so, I mean, do they put that in in their advertisement, murders did happen here. <laughs> like, they don't. oh, you know, and then like when you find out, oh gosh. <laughs> well, let's see what, what else is on the list. All right. Located in Burrville, Rhode Island is the farmhouse that the movie The Conjuring is loosely based off of. Paranormal investigators Ed and Lorraine Warren reported events of activity back in the 1970s. Due to certain circumstances, the house used to film the movie Conjuring is actually located in North Carolina. But overnight stays at the farmhouse are welcome for the right price. <laughs> okay. I didn't know that. I didn't know that the house in the movie, uh, they had two different houses, basically, you know, they filmed everything on the outside in Oregon. And then then they had a studio. But the real house 
in Rhode Island, you can stay there and it depends on the price and, and it actually gets booked up. Like people are into are it. Here? Yes. And like tons of people are like, oh my God, I felt energy. I saw something. And they're like, they have live footages of things happening in there. So, you know, mm -hmm. uh, before I said I'd stay at the uh, Stanley in Colorado, but mm -hmm. this one in Rhode Island, mm -mm. No I no way, not me. I mean, you have to be a different type of thrill seeker to want to go where like traumatic things happened in history, right? Like, mm -hmm. I'd rather skydive. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. They're both dangerous. <laughs> okay. Let's see what we got for the next countdown. Inspired by the real-life serial killer Edward Theodore Gein, the gruesome film Texas Chainsaw Massacre was released in 1974 to poor viewership and mixed reviews due to its extremely graphic nature. At that time, it was uncommon for films to have so much violence, but over the years, the film has become a cult classic, celebrated with remakes, prequels, and sequels. Contrary to popular belief, the real-life events did not occur in Texas, but instead the story of the film's main antagonist, Leatherface, actually originates in Wisconsin. From 1954 through 1957, Ging, also known as the Plainfield Butcher or Body Snatcher, wrecked havoc in small-town Plainfield, Wisconsin, mutilating at least 11 corpses. He will also use body parts from the corpses to decorate his home and to make outfits out of skin. It was also confirmed that he would dig up burial plots and mutilate the bodies. Pretty gruesome, right? Later, Gein would be sent to a mental hospital and his house set on fire. In order to loosely recreate scenes from Gein's case, production took place at a house just north of Austin, Texas. Today, fans of the film can visit the same house, which is now the Grand Central Cafe in Kingsland, Texas. Ooh. Okay. So look, everybody, supposedly, everybody wants to move to Austin, Texas. Everyone wants to go and get the cheaper houses with the good food and all this kind of stuff. But hey, there's some history there, right? So there's these places called Round Rock and Flukerville. They're north of Austin, Texas. This is where the movies were filmed for Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So a lot of people go there too. Oh my gosh, I, I can't believe I haven't been there. I mean, you know, as a horror fan, like I should, I should have visited that a long time ago when I was staying in Texas. Yeah. <laughs> I been there. yeah. And I you know, know, it's a restaurant now that you can actually go to in Kingsland, Texas. You could sit and have like burgers with knives stuck in them and they have like all kind of like weird things like leather face, you know, paraphernalia all throughout the store. Oh, paraphernalia. I was going to be like, ooh, did they, did they have leather face mugs or lampshades, you know? They sell like merchandise like that. And they even have um, a movie night or something like that at the gas station where they filmed. Mm -hmm. They have a movie night where people can come out and watch all the Texas Chainsaw Massacre films. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. I, yeah. I, okay. Yeah. So let's, let's get to the, the next clip. The 2014 film Selma, directed by Ava DuVernay, revisited some pretty historic sites that were pivotal in the progress of the civil rights movement. One of those sites was the Edmund Pettus Bridge, a national historic landmark built in 1940 in Selma, Alabama. The bridge, which was named after a Confederate brigadier general and Ku Klux Klan leader, was the real-life site of the historic and horrific Bloody Sunday incident that took place on March 7, 1965, where peaceful civil rights protesters were met with violence after marching for voting rights. Believe it or not, there was a time when people of color were not allowed to vote, especially in 1960s Alabama, thus taking away the community's right to have input in the political direction of the United States. 
In order to mitigate this, a group of activists and civil rights leaders, such as the Representative John Lewis, Hosea Williams, Amelia Boyton, and Martin Luther King, banded together to orchestrate a march from Selma to the Alabama Capitol, with the path leading over the Edmund Pettus Bridge. However, the day of the march, the group was met with opposition from police and state troopers. The entire event was televised, including the attacks on the protesters. Soon the world would know about the events of that day and increase support for the voting movement. Although it has been suggested that the name of the bridge be changed to honor Congressman John Lewis after his death in 2020, the change has yet to be made. Yeah, so you remember that movie Selma? Yes, yes, I do. Very, 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 I mean, it was a great movie from Ava DuVernay. She's one of the um, Black female directors who, who also did uh, The 13th, the documentary about mass incarceration. Um, great film, right? Uh, David Oyelowo, I said it right, right? Yeah. Oyelowo, David Oyelowo played Martin Luther King in that film. And then uh, Senator John Lewis, he just, I'm a Senator, uh, Representative John Lewis, he passed away in 2020. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I thought this would be a great addition to the list because first of all, it's, it's an actual place in Alabama you can go to today and you can like feel the, you know, the essence of that time. And we're still dealing with voting issues now. Mm -hmm. You know, with the news coming out of Georgia of how they just passed a law that would kind of uh, suppress voting rights. Um, I feel like it's more relevant than ever. Yeah, I, I definitely, uh, definitely agree with you. It's just like, you know, man, we shouldn't have to be still talking about this issue today. But, you know, a lot of things we have to we have to keep fighting for and make sure that we, you know, we people hear our voices, you know, and yeah. make sure we have a voice of our own and very proud that you know people like him paved the way you know yeah john lewis yeah and yeah. by the way Dion taylor the director he's actually working on a film to uh recapture the activists on that day like how they organized the whole march in the first place oh wow so stay tuned oh yeah that's very inspirational <laughs> let's jump into the next one yes let's jump into the next one Hotel Mumbai is an action thriller film based off real events that happened in 2008 in Mumbai at the Taj Mahal Palace Hotel in India. In a series of coordinated attacks throughout the city, terrorists took over the hotel for three days. A brave chef and kitchen worker risked their own lives to try and protect the frightened guests. Since the attack, the Taj Mahal Palace Hotel was reconstructed and is now back in operation. That's a beautiful delight. I'm, oh, I'm sorry? <laughs> I, I was just going to say, it was a beautiful uh, display, that building. Yeah. Oh, it's very grand. It's, you know, the Taj Mahal Palace. And uh, when I was watching this movie, at first, I didn't know it was a true story um, like until later on, until, you know, because at that time I was in high school and I was into sports and stuff. And so when I did my research, I was like, oh, my God, this is a true story. Yeah, people were stuck in the their hotel rooms for three days and they they actually attacked, attacked more than one place they uh, did other places in mumbai india too you know um the terrorists and it's just it's it's crazy like ha what happened could you imagine being stuck in a hotel no, for, three, for three, days? three days yeah and it's just like their help was so far away you know and they had to endure three days you know you know what it depends because if it's a vacation i could do the three days but under their circumstances heck no <laughs> and you know i mean now the taj mahal palace is rebuilt and you are able to go visit there and you can even look on uh mm -hmm. travelocity and get a hotel room and they have really nice hotel room hotel rooms they're very luxurious so yeah, yeah. awesome mm -hmm. all right i think we are at our top Three? Top two. Okay. Is it top three? Okay. Well, let's get into it. What's the next clip? Who can forget the endearing story of 1991's Beauty and the Beast, where the small town bookworm Belle finds herself in a sticky situation when she discovers a castle inhabited by a cursed prince and his servants? 
Believe it or not, the animated set of Beauty and the Beast was inspired by what has been labeled the most beautiful villages of France. Ricoeur, a small town located in northeastern France off of the Wines Road, has been known to attract visitors from all around the world. With 16th century architecture that includes cobblestone streets, timbered lined housing, colorful decor, and lively flowers, Ricoeur is one of the few towns that made it out of World War II without severe damage. Ricoeur. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right, but I call it Ricoeur. <laughs> Knowing myself, I'm probably saying it wrong, most likely. <laughs> That is, this is so cool. This information is so cool because I love Beauty and the Beast. I have it. I have the movie. <laughs> That's crazy that you found that because I wouldn't even think to look up uh, yeah. the real town, you know? Yeah, see, Disney, they're very clever. Disney, man, those people over there. I mean, from the Marvel to what else they have? They have the George Lucas, what, Star Wars. And now their, their films, I'm finding out their animations from the early 90s and the 80s are based on like real life places. What? Yeah. I just found out just right now when you told <laughs> me. <laughs> that is really cool. Like, I want to visit that place. I yeah, saw me too. Everything. I'm going to eat grapes and eat crackers <laughs> and stuff like that and drink wine. Oh my gosh. That I sounds see, nice, right? It does. I will sing the whole Beauty and the Beast soundtrack in that little town. I, pro I know everything. <laughs> I know everything. With the the apron on and carrying the book too, uh, like Belle. Oh, isn't this amazing? Oh no! Oh no! <laughs> My well, let's get into our next clip. Oh, Lord, she's going to keep singing. Let's hurry up again to the next clip. <laughs> a true story of how the McDonald brothers, Mac and Dick, let a billion-dollar burger system slip into an outsider Ray Kroc's hands. In 1948, the brothers fully redesigned and rebuilt McDonald's located in San Bernardino, California. Their main focus was burgers, shakes, and fries. In 1954, the brothers partnered with Ray Kroc to help franchise the restaurant. The franchisor took 1.9% of gross sales, leaving Mac and Dick with 0.5%. The brothers wanted to maintain only a few restaurants and didn't quite align with Ray's goals. So in 1961, Ray Kroc eventually bought out the brothers. You can visit old McDonald's today as a museum. Ooh. Now, everybody loves McDonald's, right? Yeah, <laughs> I like that. Oh, yeah. And I know you I know you saw the founder because, you know, we saw it together. And we yeah. had so many opinions about that. So what do you what do you think? Okay, the founder. I love that film for many reasons. And first of all, it's about brothers, right? So I love that, like brothers in business. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty cool. But the, the fact that they had to learn like business the hard way was like a great learning lesson for those of us that are watching, right? Yeah. And then Michael Keaton, he played a good villain. Oh, right? man. Yes. It's like you love to hate him because like, you know, they kind of made it like he was like, uh, someone you want to save and you know in the beginning when you first yeah. you know and then all of a sudden you flipped on us mm -hmm. Man. but you know we actually visited uh one of the oldest mcdonald's restaurants um in uh pasadena i believe and um the museum one is on old route 66 oh I, I, oh yeah i ran into that there's one like south south somewhere in south la that has that old school feel to it too as well like downy or something like that oh downy yes that's yeah. what it is downy. yeah it's like yeah. downy or something yeah. like that. downy yeah. california and yeah. it's really cool oh, because yeah. it actually makes me feel like i'm gonna eat a burger there because the new ones i'm like mm, no brown food for me the the one in downy is the oldest one the third one built mm -hmm. oh really yep. oh okay wow oh yeah <laughs> well, let's get to the next clip. Uh huh. Remember that opening view of the mountain that you saw in the original Lion King movie? Well, that landscape is actually located at the Amboseli National Park in southern Kenya, which is the second most popular national park in the region. 
The actual mountain is called Kilimanjaro, the highest freestanding mountain in the world. In fact, Mount Kilimanjaro is a dormant volcano. About 120,000 people a year travel to the destination to see wildlife in its natural habitat. There are zebras, giraffes, lions, and cheetahs. Other parts of the Lion King film were also inspired by the Hell's Gate and Serengeti National Parks. Wow. Kilimanjaro. I think that's how you say the volcano name, Kilimanjaro. But that's like the highest standing mountain in the world. And I've never been there in Kenya. Oh, no, I haven't been there either. But the pictures look beautiful. Yeah. Look nice. Now, OK, so people climb that mountain. Yeah, right? They definitely do. There was a lady who was like in her 80s. Um, she broke a, a world record for climbing the highest standing mountain. And there was a kid as young as seven years old, actually from California and from Texas. It was oh. two kids. Um, they climbed the mountain too, unassisted. Can you believe that? Unassisted. Unassisted. I don't know what that means, but. <laughs> Maybe they didn't hold their hands, but they was like right behind them. <laughs> <laughs> well, they broke records. It's oh. in the record book. It would be cool to break a record. We could go when we 95 you know, and climb. I don't know. I'll get back to you on that. I don't know. That might be too much. <laughs> By the way, let me tell you, it's not only a mountain, it's a volcano. It's just doormat. And they say it could erupt at any time. Well, at 95, we'll be <laughs> <don't care. laughs> You don't care. But yeah, this was a, you know, Lion Key, they based their landscape on this area. So that's pretty cool. I thought that was a great addition to the list. It is. It looks just like it. So yeah, yeah. Oh was God. that our final one? That was our final one. That was number one. Yeah. It oh was, Lord. But it was so fun. Yes, it was. Very entertaining and informative. So yeah. And you know what? Well, there's some uh, uh, that we left off the, of the list that are very popular, like Amityville, right? Oh yeah, Amityville. Mm -hmm. you know, what else? What else did we leave off? I think I, oh, you know, Conjuring, we said that, but there, Annabelle, that film, there's other locations that you can find it. Mm -hmm. oh, I don't even want to know. know. You know, all of those films, like the Conjuring films and stuff, they scare me to death. So I'm good. I'm good without that. <laughs> <laughs> so folks, catch us on the next round. I can't wait to share what we have in store for you. On 10 out of 10. See you soon.